Hello everybody and welcome to Theology 101. Today we are going to look at the relationship between God's grace and God's law. Throughout the New Testament, the apostles would contrast God's grace with God's law as a basis for one's salvation. Often, religious people attempt to gain salvation by one's obedience to God's law. However, we see that the apostles write that a person is justified by faith in Christ and not by obeying God's law. In other words, a person cannot obey God's law to merit salvation, but must receive it as a gift from God. For example, the Apostle Paul writes, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Do you notice the illustration Paul describes? A person who puts in 40 hours of work and receives a paycheck did not get paid as a gift. It was what he was owed. However, if a person did not work but received the same paycheck, then that is considered a gift, right? So how are Christians saved? They are saved by faith in Christ not by putting in hours of work or obedience to God's law. It is a person's faith and not obedience to God's law that is counted as righteousness to him. The Apostle Paul makes clear the basis of our salvation. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So when talking about God's grace, it is often portrayed in contrast to God's law. Why? Because one must work under the law while one simply receives God's grace as a gift. It is a difference between working for a paycheck versus receiving a gift. Now, if a person is not saved through the law, then what is the purpose of God's law? I think it's important to explain what I mean when I say God's law. When talking about God's law, I am referring to the detailed standard God gave to Moses beginning with the Ten Commandments. God's law explained his requirement for a holy people and was given to separate God's people from surrounding nations. Also, the law revealed that no person could obey God perfectly and needed a savior. By the time of Jesus, we see that Jewish leaders added extra rules to God's law. While the law itself was good, it was not able to change a person's heart. So when Jesus confronted the religious leaders, he was not undermining or dismissing God's law, but confronting their legalistic interpretation and in addition to God's law. In fact, Jesus said this, Do not think that I come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see, Jesus came to fulfill the law so that we can receive his righteousness through faith as opposed to obedience to the law. Imagine if you are given a calculus test when you are in the second grade. No matter how hard you try, you will never pass that test. You don't have the ability to pass this test. But imagine that you can pick another person to represent you to take this test for you. Now, you have a way of passing this test because you can choose the smartest mathematician to fulfill the requirements of this test on your behalf. This is what Jesus means by saying that he came to fulfill the law. He became a man to fulfill the requirements of the law so that we can get the credit for his work. So if Jesus fulfilled the law for us, this means that Christians are no longer under the law. We don't need to take the test if Jesus already took it for us and gave us his grade. Just as Paul writes, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Then Paul makes it clear that Christians are living under the new covenant and thus no longer are bound by the law. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. If it is true that Christians are no longer under God's law, then why do Christians still believe that God's law in the Old Testament is applicable for today? It is because some Christians argue that there are three parts to the law, moral, civil, and ceremonial. They argue that while the civil and ceremonial aspects of the law, such as animal sacrifices and dietary laws, are no longer in effect, Christians are still under God's moral law. Now here's the problem with this view. The law is seen as an indivisible unit by the New Testament writers. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Do you notice that Paul says that a person who does not abide by all of the things in the law is cursed 
or judged by the law? Look at what Jesus' half-brother James writes. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. It seems that the New Testament writers did not divide the law into three categories but viewed them as one unit. Although viewing the law through the categories of civil, ceremonial, and moral can be helpful, there is another problem with this type of division. Some laws fit more than one category. For example, the law forbidding and taking of interest is a moral and civil commandment. This is a commandment of how Israel was to deal with one another in an agricultural society, but also informs one's morality. So is this law only a civil law? Or is it also a moral law? Should Christians dismiss this law because it is civil or obey it because it is moral? You see, Christ fulfilled not only the ceremonial and civil parts of the law, but also the moral parts of the law, thus putting an end to the law. Paul argues that the entirety of the law has been set aside now that Christ has come. To say that the moral law continues for Christians goes against the truth that the entire law is no longer in force for the church. As Paul writes, Likewise, my brothers, you have also died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. In conclusion, under grace, Christians are not bound by the law as a system of life. However, does this mean that Christians should ignore and dismiss God's law? Not quite. Why? Because the Mosaic Covenant reflects God's character, and many principles in them continue in the New Covenant. Look at this Venn diagram. One circle comprises of all the commandments from the Mosaic Covenant. The other circles are all the commandments given by Christ and the apostles in the New Testament. Notice that there is an overlap between these two circles because these commandments reveal God's unchanging character. It is this overlap that Christians should obey, not because it is the way we merit salvation, but as a response to the grace that has already been shown to us through the cross of Christ. Thank you to today's sponsor, On Reverence. They offer a free digital worship music app called Maskill. If you want to check it out, I'll leave some links in the description box below. If you missed the last video about propitiation and reconciliation, I'll leave a link here for you to watch. Until next time, see you!